Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, turning out uh, for what I'm sure will be a stunning lecture. Uh, this is a, the umpteenth, I can't remember what number, lecture in the Medical Humanities Open Public Lecture Series. Uh, you're all very welcome. Um, to advertise the next one coming up in two weeks, that's uh, Professor Miranda Fricker from our own institution talking about epistemic justice in medical contexts. Again, I think that would be an absolutely fabulous lecture and I thoroughly recommend it. Um, the lecture tonight is being videoed and um, will be published along with some of the other MHS public lectures on our website and linked out in due course. Um, it's a real honour tonight to have Professor Jonathan Montgomery come to speak to us. Um, uh, he is Professor of Healthcare Law at UCL and also Chair of the Nuffield Council of Bioethics, which, as you'll know, is kind of basically the UK's national uh, voice for ethics and national place for ethical issues to be developed and uh, debated. Um, he's been a leader on many government panels um, and highly active in the area of public ethics, explaining it, uh, discussing it, leading on important bodies and so forth. To have him speak to us today is a huge honour and we're really grateful that he's taken the time to come up, speak to some of us this afternoon and uh, share his thoughts with us this evening. So I welcome him with great pleasure and hand over to him now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. I hope I've managed to turn my lapel microphone on. Does it sound as though I have? Good. Thanks very much. Um, sort of autobiographical discussions uh, this evening. So, uh, as Ian said, I've spent quite a lot of time over the past few years enmeshed in committee work, and I'm sort of re-entering uh, academic life to try and reflect a bit on, on what I might have discovered uh, doing that. And I've become very interested in trying to understand and explain how what's been going on in these committees connects in some way with public interests. Um, and so what I want to talk to you about is different ways in which sitting on something like the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, uh, or as I previously did, the Human Genetics Commission, or one I'll talk about a little bit, the Committee on the Ethics of Pandemic Influenza, um, uh, where you are being asked to engage in the sort of questions that we might engage with in academia, but somehow on behalf of and with um, the public. How does that work? Uh, and how would one make some sort of assessment about whether you've done it appropriately or got disconnected um, with the purpose? Uh, and I'm going to use as examples going through uh, debates that's going on at the moment about uh, new techniques to replace mitochondrial DNA. So um, the House of Commons on the 3rd of February um, voted to pass regulations that would permit the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority to licence the use of techniques that uh, we hope will enable uh, clinicians to overcome really quite serious mitochondrial disease um, issues in very limited cases um, for specifically identified women where it's, uh, there's good reason to think that they will uh, only have children affected by significant health problems. And this is a really significant global event um, because it raises a question about the difference between therapies that just affect the individual being treated and therapies that would be passed on to their children. So those of you who know about these things will know that as the difference between somatic therapies and germline therapies. And internationally that's been seen to be a very significant line uh, and internationally we seem to be stepping over it. Um, so for some people no, this is a, a really big step. We'll know what the House of Lords thinks later this month uh, when they vote on it. Uh, and it's something that uh, depending on your point of view has either been a very long time coming, because clinicians have been discussing this since at least 2000 and going through a series of steps, or is being rushed because we don't know enough about the safety um, of the uh, diseases. It's also quite interesting because it plays into the question that some have about the UK's commitment to bioethics, and some would say that we're a rogue bioethics state. We have no National Ethics Committee, um, we have the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, which steps into that space, but it's a non-government uh, organisation. We haven't signed the Avido Convention on Bioethics, mainly because our view on the status of the human embryo is a bit different from uh, elsewhere in Europe. Um, 
We appear to be happy to play fast and loose with this international convention on uh, germline, uh, position on germline therapy. Um, so maybe this is further evidence that we don't take the public interest very seriously uh, in bioethics. It's sort of course of view that I hold, being enmeshed in uh, sitting on those sorts of bodies. And if I told the story, uh, I would point out that the Nuffield Council on Bioethics is highly active in the community of national ethics committees. It's part of the steering groups for WHO meetings of the European Forum on National Ethics Committees. Uh, whenever we go, people seem to be very pleased with the reports that we've produced and they cite them uh, and use them. So it's not that we're absent from that space. Um, you will also go internationally and you would have mostly pretty positive discussions about the role of the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority as a mechanism for overseeing scientific advances, which enables us to take measured steps uh, and hold people to account. Uh, and if you read the World Health Organization's review of uh, research ethics committees, they would hold up the work of the UK in attempting to find some way of accrediting and monitoring whether ethics committees do what's expected uh, as being good practice rather than poor practice. And I'll declare an interest because I also chair the Health Research Authority uh, and claim some credit from that, although it predates my involvement. So there are two completely different stories we might tell about how well um, we do this. Um, and I want to reflect on three things that have struck me as I've been involved with the debate over the mitochondrial therapies um, that seem to me ways of understanding how what we do connects um, with the public interest uh, and also reflect a bit on some other debates around uh, assisted dying and the emergence of a, a new type of judicial activism in this area in my academic roles. So first of all, I want to discuss the extent to which Reflecting the public interest involves in the debates in these public uh, spheres, the committees and the like, having some sort of different ground rules um, to the way in which we might discuss it uh, in questions afterwards, or you might discuss it in academic courses, or you might deliberate about taking your own bioethical decisions. So the idea that somehow public bioethics has different ground rules and different concepts uh, than what we do elsewhere. Secondly, I want to discuss what seems to me the model that the Nuffield Council on Bioethics pursues, um, which is more to do not with the ground rules, but how you foster a healthy coming together of people with interests uh, in the public space um, to discuss it. And thirdly, I want to talk a bit about how we might separate the idea of public interest from private interest in bioethics. And my contention there is that there is a sense in which we have a public interest in people doing private bioethics, but the delineation between them uh, may well be changing, not necessarily for the better. So first of all, um, the idea that the best way to do public bioethics, so bioethic, bioethics in the public interest, you know, is to think about it as being a discrete activity uh, with its special rules. It's important the way we talk about things and the concepts we use. And I was discussing this with my elder daughter um, a few weeks ago, saying how hard the Nuffield Council had uh, argued that we shouldn't talk about three-parent babies. And she said, well, you failed there, didn't you? Uh, all the media discusses that uh, as a uh, sort of way of thinking about it. And there's no doubt that this is something that the public discusses. Um, these are very human stories, pictures of people affected by uh, the conditions, these are the primeval fears that Mary Shelley wrote about in Frankenstein. This is science fiction, both of the optimistic and the dystopian kind, where you're trying to make a sense of what the future might be like. And yet when it becomes part of a deliberative process uh, by public bodies, it feels a little bit different. We're supposed to try and put aside some of those questions, although that doesn't happen in Parliament, which is full of stories, um, but it does uh, in bodies like the Nuffield Council. And I've begun reflecting on whether or not we should borrow from the work of the political philosopher John Rawls around the idea that there's some sense of a public reasoning process um, that's going on. So his argument is that in a, um, a liberal democracy, somehow we should put aside um, our own versions of what's right and wrong, which he describes as comprehensive doctrines of truth or right, and move into a political process which is based on 
reasonable arguments with each other as citizens, um, setting our sides self aside from the particular reasons we have for thinking things are, are right or wrong. And this is a particular problem around religious doctrines. Uh, and the argument is that if we're to engage in a common public debate about the things that we should do, we need to put aside the theological arguments we disagree on and find a way of talking a common language. Um, and he says that this is something that should bind the official members of our society. So apologies to those who know rules better than I do, but you know, the people who are bound by these supposed requirements of public reason are our judges, our public officials, our legislators. And when they work, they have to come up with justifications that are acceptable as, as public reasons, particularly when they're invoking the coercive powers um, of the state. Now, this strikes me as a really big legitimacy problem that people writing in law and bioethics have dodged for far too long. You know. We used to talk when I was learning the student about the challenges of imposing one particular view of morality on others, and we were sent back to writings in the 1950s about homosexuality and a bit later on about pornography. And yet, we happily talked about what the right position was and a whole series of contested moral issues. And what Rawls shows is that people who enter the public sphere, as he sees it, um, change the way they talk to accommodate the ground rules of public debate. So he quotes a Roman Catholic cardinal uh, who argues against the idea that abortion should be a right, appealing to political values of public peace, the essential protection of human rights, commonly accepted standards of moral behaviour within a community of law. Translating, if you like, the reasons why the Catholic Church thought that things were inappropriate in terms of liberalisation of abortion into reasons that could be accepted by people who didn't share that moral tradition. And the implication of that is that the public interest in reasoning about bioethics gets radically disconnected between, from the private reasons um, why people think things are right or wrong. Rawls says... Uh, the Catholic Church's non-public reason requires its members to follow its doctrines, and that's perfectly consistent without also honouring separately public reasons. So how might this work in the context of uh, the public interest in our bioethics? We should then, if this model makes sense, be able to draw out types of argument which are not dependent on particular versions of right and wrong, but are dependent on uh, issues about public authority, uh, issues about consistency of practice, um, issues about things that we could hold whether or not we like the particular uh, issues in place. And certainly you can see some examples of that sort of argument. So I sat for a while, I think technically I still sit because I don't think it's been stood down, on something called CIAPI, the Committee on the Ethical Aspects of Pandemic Influenza. And we were charged with producing an ethical framework to assist the government in planning uh, its response to the pandemic. And that seems classically the territory that John Rawls was thinking about. We weren't advising individuals about what they should do for themselves or clinicians about what they should do in clinical practice. We were advising government organisations about how they should understand their commitments to the public good. And as an exercise in that, I think it was remarkably successful. Um, it started off as something internal to the Department of Health and it ended up being adopted by the Cabinet Office across the whole of the UK. And as part of the planning process for pandemic, a whole series of policy documents were produced and they were sent to this committee to review against the ethical framework to see whether or not they were consistent. And we got some fascinating bits of feedback. We were told for example, what rubbish our ethical framework was, because it was no use to anybody, but if only we did it the way these policy documents, which had been produced to be consistent with the ethical framework, had done, uh, we would have done a much better job. And it was a very abstract framework, but it captured the sorts of ideas that I think John Rawls uh, is after. So it proclaimed that the key fundamental principle for planning for a pandemic was equal concern and respect, which meant that everybody mattered, Everyone matters equally, even though it doesn't mean that everyone's treated the same. The interests of each person are the concerns of all of us and of society. The harm that might be suffered by every person matters, and so minimising the harm that a pandemic might cause is a central concern. And from that, we identified a number of decision-making principles, 
Treat people with respect, minimise the harm a pandemic could cause, act fairly, work together. Reciprocity, which had a very specific meaning, which was if we ask people to take risks because of the pandemic, we should also uh, take precautions to make sure that we do the best to stop them uh, suffering because of what they've done for the common good. We had a discussion of that uh, about Ebola about what were the responsibilities of states to clinicians who went out and put themselves at risk, which they would not otherwise be at if they hadn't gone out there to assist. That implies that because of the principle of reciprocity, we should take steps to try and provide them care that is broadly equivalent to what they might have had uh, if they were in Western hospitals. Uh, and then we had a set of principles around decision-making and responding flexibly um, to things that emerged and one thing we found was that this process of trying to reflect the public good in this bioethics document was thought to be particularly unhelpful for people who were on the front line working as clinicians. Now, we had never said that it would be helpful for them, um, but uh, we were criticised, and there was a particularly heated meeting with one of the committees of clinicians trying to work out how they should respond uh, about discussing it. But it also, for me, brought home the value of that sort of approach, because one of the things that was said to us was we needed something which was much more directed at specific clinical decisions. And there was a set of guidelines that had been developed in Canada about triaging intensive care facilities. So who should you provide intensive care to? Uh, and this was put forward to us as a much more satisfactory guide to clinical behaviour than what we'd promoted, which was true. But as we dug into it, we found an element of that set of guidelines that seemed to us to conflict with the ethical framework that we developed. Because in those guidelines, there was a scoring process to identify who it was appropriate to prioritise. And that scoring process included um, an age criterion. When we asked the intensivist, they told us, well, this is a proxy for the effectiveness of care. But when we read the papers that generated the document, what we discovered was that the original version, that they generated this document by surveying intensivists um, and asking them what evidence helped you decide um, how to prioritise. And the original version had had no age criterion in it because the researchers drawing it up had not seen it as a proxy for any particular outcomes. And the age criterion was only put in because intensivists said, we think they should be an age criterion. So that was fundamentally in breach of the principle that everyone matters equally. It wouldn't have been had that age criterion been rooted in some prediction of outcome, but it was when we held it up against this, this process. So it does seem to me that that suggests there's some sense uh, in the idea that we could come up with some generic criteria that, against which we judge specific versions of uh, how we should operate. So what we want then, if we take this sort of approach, is to try and see whether in the debates about the mitochondrial issue, we see appeals to concepts of some particular type of public bioethics um, reason. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to see how the Church of England has positioned itself in this debate, and indeed how it positioned itself in relation to the debates last summer about assisted dying. Because what the Church of England said in its response to the consultation on the mitochondrial regulations, uh, and you might not realise this if you've only read the Telegraph um, summary of, of what they said a few weeks ago, Church of England said it was supportive in principle of the use of these techniques, but concerns have been raised, for example, about mismatches between the mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear genome. And there was scientific um, disagreement they identified, and therefore more research was needed into safety and efficacy of mitochondrial replacement therapy before regulations are introduced permitting the technique. Further research, they argued, uh, is more likely to be beneficial about safety and efficacy is more likely to be beneficial in the longer term than premature application of uncertain techniques. The introduction of regulations ought to await the results of such research. Elsewhere, So that's an appeal to a safety criterion quite independent of any particular um, uh, view on the rightness or wrongness of interventions in uh, genome. Elsewhere, they talk about the principle of consistency. So they point out that these process, at least one of these processes would involve the deliberate creation of embryos for the sole purpose of destroying them in order to use the techniques. And the point they make is 
is that that would be inconsistent with the current policy about spare embryos. So that's independent of the view, the morality of using spare embryos. It's an argument about consistency in, in public life. And then they also include in the recommendation that children born after mitochondrial placement therapies ought to have access to medical and personal information uh, with regard to the donors. And they point that out because they say mitochondrial replacement affects the genetic constitution of resulting children and as a consequence is likely to affect their sense of personal identity to some extent. Now if you took off the label of who sent that in, you would have no way of identifying what sort of group made those um, claims because they are claims that appeal to types of reasoning which are independent um, of the particular faith traditions. So we're interested in safety, consistency. Uh, we're interested in aligning legal conceptions of identity with social expectations. Um, we're not interested in translating a particular theological account of what people are or their origins uh, into a, a legal position. And there's broadly a similar um, issue at stake in look at the position taken by the faith communities around assisted dying in the House of Lords debates, whereas they've took a position, and I'm talking here about the faith leaders, different positions by individuals, but the faith leaders, so the archbishops, the current archbishops, the former archbishop took a slightly different view, uh, the, uh, those speaking for the Jewish uh, and the uh, Hindu communities, made arguments about vulnerability. They made arguments based on their pastoral experience of supporting people about what, what might be the results of liberalising the law in terms of pressure. They didn't make arguments about the sanctity of life or the theological origins, although individuals um, did express um, those sorts of views. So what we've done is we've shifted the debate from what they might talk about for the faithful into what they think is common ground uh, in the public good. So that enables us to elaborate uh, a number of aspects uh, of this discussion. Uh, and we might think about, well, what does the concept of safety mean in public reason? The concept of safety in my own life is pretty much dependent on risks that I choose to run and what I think is, is worth doing. Maybe the concept of safety in public life uh, is connected to the comparability of our level of confidence with other things that we um, permit. So if you read, you can see some of this quite interestingly. There's a, uh, a storify of the Twitter exchanges that um, went alongside debate in the House of Commons, not the debate on the regulations, but a, a debate exploring the uh, issues on the Monday night before the vote. Um, and you see some lovely discussions about different things that are being said, some kinder um, than others. Uh, I think the two most interesting for these discussions are comparisons about uh, the safety of mitochondrial replacement compared to more natural mechanisms for conception. Uh, and when you look at the natural wastage of gametes and embryos that exerts, it exists in the normal reproductive cycle, if our comparator for safe enough is, is it safer to have a baby through mitochondrial replacement and IVF, uh, it probably is, uh, than just to try and see what happens, particularly if you're dealing with a situation where you know what you're going to pass on genetically uh, is going to be a pretty difficult life um, to the children. The other thing that was raised was the comparability between our assessments of safety now uh, and what we would have done with the work of Robert Edwards and Patrick Steptoe over uh, the early days of IVF. And I think there's a reasonably widely held view that we wouldn't have IVF now if we were going through the regulatory processes that are in place um, today because of an anxiety uh, around safety questions. So there's something about safety being a common factor, but it not necessarily becoming easy to work out what the implications um, of that would be. Second interesting element, I think, comes out of interrogating the idea of public reasoning in bioethics in this context, is the extent to which we should have confidence in our regulatory institutions. Um, and this bears particular importance to our response to the idea of being on a slippery slope. So again, you can, of course, tell this story um, in more than one way. But the story you would tell if you were supportive of this step uh, is that it has been a set of incremental steps that uh, regulators have taken, starting with permitting some of the research, now asking the permission from Parliament uh, 
to enable the HFEA to allow particular examples of the use of this therapy in named individual cases where there's a clearly demonstrated um, risk of things going wrong and where um, it's clear that what will go wrong will be quite significant. There was a lot of talk in the House of Commons about the need to have clinical trials before we proceeded, but this is essentially the clinical trial that you would be permitting. We won't know what the next step is and whether it's appropriate to go further um, unless we take that step. So if we have confidence in our public institutions, we're not on a slippery slope. We are taking a step-by-step -step approach and at each point we could take a different view. But if you opened the Independent last Sunday, you will have seen an immediate spread from a scientist in the USA saying, well, this technique will be much better just for providing fertility treatment for older women. Um, and that's played out in the papers as an example uh, of the slippery slope. So it seems to me that we should have expectations in our public ethics that regulators act in good faith and that people do what they're supposed to do. But of course, it's entirely reasonable for you and your private ethics to have the view that we've heard all this before. They said that about abortion and look where we are um, now. Those are two different types of category. And the third question, I think, uh, about this idea of public reasons is where we place international consensus. So as I said early on, this is a step which can be said to be a step over a line drawn in the sand in the international consensus uh, around germline therapy. If you look at the Rawlsian position, he expects fundamental human rights to be uh, one of the aspects of public reason. And I'll come back to another version of fundamental human rights um, towards the end. Um, but you can also see considerable criticism of the authority of international conventions around bioethics. I've already pointed out we don't sign them anyway. Um, uh, but... Uh, it's quite interesting to think that a consensus built around a very specific type of technology um, some years ago uh, is a form of words which we then reason from uh, going forwards uh, and asking questions about what exactly lay behind the germline therapy probably leads you to the conclusion that most people thought that was so far in the future you know, that actually they felt it was a way of focusing the debate on things that could happen and not allowing discussions of things that, that might not. My own take on this uh, is that the germline therapy rule line tells us an awful lot of why, why we should be cautious and makes it appropriate to regulate the step uh, and learn from it because we know that if there are risks, they may go on for a long time uh, into the future. There are other areas where it becomes very difficult to make it work. It's very hard to understand how consent works in the context of germline therapy, because who are you going to ask? Um, get some interesting questions about um, the focus of identity. Um, but the important question here is whether our public reason in bioethics enables us to close off around particular concepts, uh, a fixed point in the sand that we then reason from. And I'm pretty nervous about that as a mechanism um, for public bioethics for much the same sort of reason as I'm pretty nervous about the way principalism has developed in medical ethics. Uh, it's separated out our reasons for believing things from our, our application uh, of those things. Uh, and I'm reminded of a nice phrase uh, in the introduction to Tom Cox's book, Thieves of Virtue When Bioethics Stole Medicine, uh, in which he describes it in these terms. Bioethics began with citizens engaged in public debate over health care, but quickly became a profession whose members spoke a language generally inaccessible to the average um, person. And depending on who you read, this is uh, bioethics misappropriated issue from citizens, as he describes it, or stole them from doctors, uh, or maybe just play doctors at their own game of keeping everything so confusing and uh, esoteric that uh, we couldn't actually get involved. But the particular point here is we need to ask ourselves whether or not engaging in this idea that there's some special ground rules around public interest in bioethics which are different from the way we mostly talk about it runs the risk that we appropriate it to a, a particular expert group uh, and lose our roots uh, in genuine public interest. And I have a particular view on the odd difference about UK public bioethics in terms of faith communities compared to what I see going on elsewhere when I meet people from other national ethics committees. 
where our religious leaders, as I hope I've described, translate their reasons for doing things into publicly acceptable reasons and lose the connection between why they thought it uh, in the first place. And most national um, bioethics committees, and actually this includes the USA, uh, have a pretty good sprinkling of people with theological expertise on them. But that's not true uh, of the position in the UK. So you can see from that that we might construct a set of rules about what counts as acting in the public interest around particular concepts of public bioethics which are different from public bioethics or academic bioethics or clinical ethics. Um, a second way of doing this, and this I think is the model that the Nuffield Council on Bioethics uh, seeks to explore, is not thinning out the comprehensive theories of ethics as the Rawlsian metaphor um, has us do, but recognising the richness of it. So what Nuffield believes it's doing, and you can tell me whether you think it does when we get to questions afterwards, is to sort of construct a space for a healthy public discourse uh, about bioethical issues. Uh, so it has a particular commitment to being open-minded and inclusive. Its strategic plan says it's committed to the position that no single view or approach to bioethics should be favoured, and the expression of all views should be encouraged uh, and welcomed. So almost in the exact opposite of the idea of a public bioethics reason, the idea is that everything should be heard. And what we're trying to create is the discourse that enables that to happen. Now, Nuffield operationalises that uh, in a number of ways. So one thing that we try and do is to put together people to work on particular issues in working parties who don't agree and re uh, reflect a range of views. Uh, and uh, we've recently published a report on biodata, which included people from radically different ends of the spectrum. So Ross Anderson and Cambridge, who would be hard pushed to trust any official body with any data, uh, from people involved in uh, establishing Genomics England uh, and pulling together the 100,000 Genome um, Project. And the point of that is, if they can work together and reach some form of common view, uh, that makes a very constructive contribution uh, to our public discussion. If anybody is outside the tent, then why would they take seriously um, the conclusions that we reached? We then work by opening up our processes to calls for evidence, uh, and we seek to be uh, fair and open-minded in our assessment of all the things that uh, come in, and we seek to recount what we've heard as part of our report, so that our reports report on what the public debate is, as well as reach um, conclusions. So this is both... Um, uh, an attempt to put together a range of views, a safety net that if we've missed that out, people can talk to us. And it's not just reactive, there's also a proactive element of the working party seeking out views um, that they think they need to understand. And our model is that the fact that we listen to everything doesn't commit us to simply accepting at face value what people say. So we set out a sort of sense of what are the characteristics of arguments that we should take seriously. So we talk about the fact that we should be multidisciplinary, we should learn from and listen to contributions from all disciplines, but having heard them, we should try and identify the highest level of expertise, the best available evidence around those questions, and test out what we're being told and what we're hearing for coherence and rationality. Uh, and try and provide what we describe as careful and comprehensive analysis uh, of, of what's there. So fundamentally, what we're trying to create on that is a position where all views come into the frame, where all views are explored, but we sort of try and sift out what we think are the, the truth criteria that go with particular types of claims. So if people are making claims about science, we would test that against what we understand to be the best science. If they're making claims uh, which are around uh, people's perceptions of their identity, we try and understand what the learning is um, about that. So when we looked at the mitochondrial donation, um, what we sought to do, having identified that there was a very important question about the identity of people born after mitochondrial replacement therapy, we sought to understand the various ways in which identities are thought to be constructed, socially constructed, uh, individually constructed, genetically constructed. Uh, 
and we sought to draw on uh, the literature from the relevant disciplines uh, and make sense of what, what we thought those things led us to. And then we differentiated the different possible consequences of those types of identity claims, um, and that led us to draw out separate views on what the connection was between different types of identity and the idea of parenthood and the legal status that goes with being uh, a gamete donor or an organ donor and how comparable those senses of identities um, were. Uh, and in each case, Nuffield reached the conclusion that while it was entirely possible, as the Church of England response identified, that people subjectively would have a sense of an identity connection we didn't think that led in the public domain to ascribing the very specific legal statuses of parenthood um, or uh, gamete donor uh, to the mitochondrial DNA donors. Now, it may, of course, turn out that that's entirely wrong, um, but what we've done is to apply our tests of matching up the types of claims with the type of expertise uh, in a deliberative process. I'll be happy to talk about that uh, shortly. But the essence of this is that we're not claiming that we need to have people translating their way of talking things into Nuffield's way of talking things. We're trying to judge the way in which people come to us talking about the problems against the criteria that seem to follow from their particular um, approach. It does assume that we can disentangle those approaches so we can tell the difference between a claim based on science uh, and a claim based on social construction, or a claim based on people's experiences uh, of uh, identity and connection. So safety, we would generally construe as being a scientific matter. What level of safety makes something publicly acceptable is a socially constructed um, question. I've talked a bit about uh, identity, but I guess the no, fundamental position on this can be captured in the idea that Nuffield Council doesn't really believe that bioethics is a discipline. Uh, don't quite quote me on that, That's, uh, although my predecessors have been quoted to that extent. The Nuffield Council sets out to be a council on bioethics, not a council of bioethicists. So actually it's seeking to assume that there isn't a discrete discipline of bioethics and a particular type of doing this. It sets out to assume that there's a multiplicity of ways of doing it, and its job is to knit those together in able to create some sort of public position. Now, that hasn't necessarily got us very close to the idea of the public interests. Um, it, we're seeking to extend that in terms of a broader debate, partly built on the back of our reports and partly built on uh, the idea of fostering um, uh, the processes by which we reach our conclusions being more open and transparent. So, in principle, we're seeking to get a rather more diverse council membership. My notes say you don't have to be a professor to be on Nuffield Council of Bioethics, but it does help. Um, if you looked at our website, you would think it helps quite a lot. Um, but we seek to extrapolate our reports into educational materials. Uh, and if you look at um, A-level texts around uh, e even the stuff on religious studies, we'll often use bits of Nuffield reports to illustrate um, the issues that are there. We're doing some work at the moment on children in research, uh, and we've collaborated uh, to run a young person's ethics committee to understand how young people see the issues uh, of uh, questions that ethics committees get up to. In the last few reports, we've begun to propose a set of processes of public dialogue to run alongside uh, policy making. So in our work on emerging biotechnologies, we argued that choices about which biotechnologies to back need to be taken after public engagement exercises about the um, risks. And our biodata report has reflected on the difficulty, shall we say, that care.data has found itself on in trying to build some public confidence in the idea that if we bring health records together, we can provide a better service than if we keep them all segmented. Through the idea that the way to move forward on this is to establish a public dialogue that will enable us to have a reasonably common sense of what might be a morally reasonable expectation of this and only proceed on the basis of making people offers on the basis of what seems to be an acceptable uh, set of choices, not impose expectations uh, from above. 
I hope we'll get to some of that uh, in questions, but let me end by reflecting a little bit on the third area. So I've talked about, is there some special type of reasoning that reflects the public interest in bioethics? Uh, is that have some content about concepts which are separate from our private bioethics? Is this about creating a space where we all get together and haggle and argue and come up with some degree of consensus? What about the idea that actually the public interest might lie in not engaging in this enterprise at all and that people should be able to decide things for themselves? Well, in the letter that the Times published with all those Nobel Prize winners, which way down on I signed as um, chair of the Nuffield Council of Bioethics, the very interesting formulation of what was at stake in the mitochondrial um, debate, uh, and it ends up like this. The question that parliamentarians could, should consider is not whether they'd want to use this technology themselves, but whether there are good grounds to prevent afflicted families from doing so. We believe that those who know what it's like to care for and sometimes lose an extremely sick child are the people best placed to decide whether this technology is right for them with medical advice and within the strict regulatory framework proposed. Now, this is a claim that the public interest in bioethics should be carved up in those things which are part of public decision making and those things which are left um, for individuals to choose. So by implication and extrapolating slightly from uh, just the text of the letter, um, what that seems to identify is that this isn't just a private issue, do the families want it? It's one they need to take in conjunction with health professionals. So it's a technology that we would restrict to health professionals. And it's also a technology that we would restrict to governance regimes through the, health and fertilizer, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority so that it can only approve specific therapies on a particular basis. But inside that space, it's a matter for private decision making. So what we're doing there is saying the public interest gets you so far about the safety uh, and the monitoring and the oversight, and then it becomes a matter of private decision making. Now, I think that's actually broadly the same pattern as we use in the Abortion Act 1967 to regulate choices about the termination of pregnancy. Because, and I'm happy to talk later about how it really works, but just think about the schema of it. Uh, the idea is that society has a stake in defining the question. The question is around uh, whether or not going on with the pregnancy is a greater risk um, than uh, stopping it, or maybe the question is around the serious risk of a serious abnormality. And society only permits women to take the choice when it's framed um, by that, but it doesn't ask questions either of the woman or of the doctor who signs the form about whether that is their actual motive for terminating the pregnancy. Uh, it creates a space for private decision-making constrained by a, a public account of what might be an acceptable reason going forward. And Nuffield has flirted with this sort of idea in its report on donor conception. And in the report on donor conception, um, we formed a view that donor-conceived children should know that they were donor-conceived and be able to therefore exercise their rights um, to trace back their identities. But we didn't think it followed from that that parents should be obliged to tell them. And at the launch, we had quite a lot of criticism for not having the guts to move from the fact that if we thought this was the right thing to do, surely we must also think that you must be forced to do it. But what we felt was that actually this was a circumstance where the public interest about what the right thing to do was pretty clear, but it didn't justify coercive enforcement. We need to create the space framed by the expectation about the right way to do it that freed families to take responsibility for exercising bioethical judgment. So what we're doing in that is we're seeking to define a private space coloured by or overshadowed by um, a sense of what is an appropriate bioethical argument based on public um, reflection. So we have a public interest, I think, in the fact that people take those decisions responsibly and have a sense of what counts as an argument, but it doesn't justify us removing their moral agency from them and making them do what we think um, is right. Now, I think that's rather different from the position that the Supreme Court has got us in over assisted dying, where it seems to be wanting to say 
um, that where we're dealing with matters of human rights, this becomes a no-go area for public bioethics. You know, that the point about its decision in uh, Nicholson uh, is that we have to preserve not the idea that this is something that we can uh, charge as being a morally responsible decision to take, but you, the agent, are expected to take it, so much as it's not public interest at all. It's a space into which Parliament go go because it's a private space delineated by our human rights to privacy. Or if you come from Canada uh, in the last few weeks, it's delineated by the right to life. Uh, because according to the Canadian Supreme Court, the fact that if I, don't, if I can't have help dying in the way I want at some stage in the future, I'm likely to commit suicide now, and that threatens my right to life. And as a, uh, as a result, my right, life, right to life generates uh, an entitlement to be assisted to die uh, in the future. Now, that seems to me a different type of argument. It's an argument which is not about the public interest in bioethics at all. It's about the private interest prevailing over public questions. And I would love to discuss that with you, so I shall stop now uh, and see what you have to say to me. Thanks very much.